Okay. So good evening and welcome. As I said, this is Critical Conversations. We'll be identifying mental health concerns and substance abuse within our community. My name is Lucas Jagir. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Schools. Thank you for joining us to listen, to learn, to engage in tonight's panel discussion where we'll hear from diverse perspectives representing education, government, law enforcement, healthcare, parents and guardians, and people with lived experience. The mental health of our students and their families has always been an important priority. But the ongoing stress that many of our children and families are experiencing and managing continues to be a critical conversation that we must have. The pandemic has shown that our kids are dealing with a lot. They have been uniquely vulnerable. As parents, guardians, and educators, we are in a prime position to recognize and address the warning signs of mental health decline in our kids, as well as behaviors that demonstrate unhealthy ways of managing stress and trauma. Research has consistently found that toxic stress and adverse childhood experiences may precede substance use disorders, suggesting that identifying and supporting students with mental health concerns may reduce the negative impacts of trauma and cumulative adversity. We can't always control the adversity we are faced with, but what we can do is work together on how we set up our systems and structures to promote nurturing environments, whatever that looks like at school and at home. <clears throat> we must meet the moment and collaborate to optimize our outcomes. As a result of participating in this evening's event, we hope that you walk away with a deeper perspective, understand the supports available, and learn strategies to identify and address mental health and substance use concerns at home. We recognize this topic is complex and goes beyond what we can address in one evening. Be assured that our Franklin Substance Use Abuse Task Force will continue this work. And if you're interested to learn more about childhood adversity after tonight, I recommend the following. The Deepest Well, Healing Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. It's an insightful read, compelling science, and Dr. Harris's approach to, in this book to addressing childhood adversity provides hope that with the right interventions, and re, you can reverse and heal long-term effects of trauma. And the second is a website called ACE Stress Clusters. And this provides information about those right interventions. And as we move forward in this complex work in supporting our children, you know, I urge you to start by putting on your own masks, <clears throat> your own oxygen masks, because we need you. The stress buses are evidence-based stress mitigation strategies that help regulate stress and build resilience. And they work for both children and adults. So leading by example is also an important message that I want to send in the community, because it's vital that we work on our own mental health in order to strengthen the, the mental health of our children. Before we begin, I want to thank the members of our Substance Abuse Task Force and the SAFE Coalition for their commitment to this work, especially our panelists who are here this evening, the SAFE Coalition, tonight's facilitator, Dr. Ann Bergen, my colleague and director of student services, Paula Morano, the FHS School Adjustment Counselors who are here with us tonight, Jennifer Briggs and Ann Davies, and our student representatives, who you'll see working to facilitate the hidden in plain sight display later, Gretchen, Bridget, and Vedega. This evening will include parent education, a panel discussion, an audience Q&A, and breakout sessions with panels in the hidden in plain sight display. <clears throat> Franklin is fortunate to have Safe Coalition as partners in this critical work, and it's my pleasure to introduce the Executive Officer of Safe Coalition, Mrs. Jennifer Nunn. Jen has been a leader in this area and provided professional development for school counselors, counseled and educated our students and our families in supporting them in crisis. So please join me in welcoming Mrs. Jennifer Knight. Hello everyone, good evening. I'm so happy to be here back at Franklin High School where I graduated many, many years ago in 2004. And it is such an honor, especially to be on stage with so many incredible professionals 
who have dedicated their careers to working with community members to really engage in sensitive conversations, especially related to mental health and substance use. So about six and a half years ago, uh, myself and a group of community members got together and we developed the SAFE Coalition. Six and a half years ago, the landscape in Franklin was really focused on the opioid epidemic. And knowing that we wanted our loved ones and our friends and our families to not fall victim to the opioid epidemic, we really wanted to do something and be action oriented. If you had told us six and a half years ago that we would be here at the Franklin High School Auditorium in 2021 talking about the impacts of mental health related to substance use and most specifically THC in our adolescents, I probably would have laughed because I would not have ever thought that the landscape that we're living in right now is a landscape that we would have projected back then. So what we really realized in working together as a collective group here is that our young folks are crucial to our families, to our support networks, to the growth of our communities. And prior to COVID, we were working with adolescents to really identify where there were substance use concerns, how they were related to mental health, and how to get that individual the right care. During COVID, we were kind of thrown for a loop. We, just like the rest of the world, were kind of shut down. We weren't able to meet with families one-on-one. -on -one. We weren't able to give the big hugs. We weren't able to meet with students one-on-one -on -one to talk about the things that were really sensitive in their lives. And so just like the students that we were working with, we felt a bit isolated and a bit disconnected. As the world started opening up and as we together worked with our partners to hear what each one of us has been dealing with over the last year and a half, one of the consistent trends that we all recognized was the need to have really deep and honest conversations with family members about what our adolescents are going through. Through 2021 so far, we've worked with 43 high school and middle school families. All of those except for one scored a five or higher on ACEs. That means that our young people are surrounded by or have been impacted by domestic violence, sexual assault, and substance use. That's a pretty incredible number. Now maybe those numbers were there before, but we just weren't taking the inventory. But what we know are that our young people have been home, have been isolated, their ways of learning and connecting with the world have been challenged, and one of the consistent messages that our kids have been getting through social media is that substances are able to quell those thoughts and feelings that are the most uncomfortable in us. It's been really incredible, the journey of THC coming into our communities and dispensaries opening up. And again, six and a half years ago, I don't think that I ever would have believed that this would have been something that would be in our community. So just like all of you have had to learn and grow and shift and change, we at the Safe Coalition had to do that as well. We have become allies in learning about THC and learning about marijuana and understanding the dispensary regulations and what that really means to our community. Because if we don't put that work in and if we shut those folks out, we aren't learning either. And that doesn't give us an opportunity to talk to all of you about how to really open your hearts and your minds to some of the really challenging pieces about mental health and substance use. So in working with the dispensary folks and with some other doctors and we have a partnership with Stanford University, What's going on right now is really different than what happened maybe in the 60s and 70s as it relates to THC and cannabis. So I'm sure that many of you have seen online or on the news the impact of e-cigarettes and vaping. And two years ago, our focus was on nicotine and vaping and how that was impacting our young people, their lungs and their chemical health and what that was doing to their overall biology of their body. And now we've really transitioned into THC in those vapes. And one quick statistic, for one vape cartridge of THC, that equals 66 joints in 1990. So what we often hear working with families is, you know, my child is really struggling with anxiety and depression, and I really want to be able to help them. And I know that weed is frowned upon, I know that cannabis is not something that we want to encourage, and at the same time, I want them to feel better. Is there a way to dose my child? I use THC products when I was younger, and I'm fine. And I think what we really have to look at, and what we've all been really looking at, and working with families, and working in the industry, is, the amount of THC that's impacting our young people. So a, a few statistics, you know, San Francisco, the 60s and 70s, the THC, the weed that was being used was about one to 3%. 
Right now, um, most of the THC that our kids are utilizing is 50% or higher. Most of us in the Safe Coalition work with students who are often dabbing. And if that's a term that you have heard before, please don't be freaked out about this statistic. We're here to support you. So a dab right now is 98% THC. So when we work with families and we try to provide a well-rounded number and statistical information about THC and where we are now and where we used to be a few decades ago, the landscape has drastically changed. But what's also drastically changed is how our young people are able to move through mental health systems and challenges. So many of the folks that we work with who are under the age of 18, mainly between the ages of 14 and 17 and a half, share with us that they started struggling with their mental health well before they started using substances. Early on in school, they felt isolated. They felt like they weren't enough. They either weren't the top athlete or they weren't the scholar or they were being compared to someone else in their family, or they were comparing themselves to other people. And so that feeling of not feeling enough is really something that we've learned from listening to our young folks that students have chosen to use substances because it quells that feeling. So when we talk with our young folks about what it really means to use substances, the conversation always comes back to mental health. Today and tonight, we are so happy that all of you are here because you're here to both highlight that you are open to receiving support and that you have more hope that the way that you felt yesterday about the things that are going in your household doesn't need to be the way that you feel about how things are going to happen tomorrow. Every single one of us on this stage is open and willing and dedicated to supporting you and your family. You are not alone. Tonight, you'll hear from incredible panelists in the work that each one of us are doing in very unique and different ways. We invite you to listen, we invite you to talk to us after, and we certainly invite you to come and check out the Hidden Plain Sight display. Thank you so much for being here, and we hope to meet you after. Right now, I'd like to, meet, to introduce Dr. Ann Bergen. especially for their leadership in the Substance Abuse Task Force and all the work that they've done and just to make sure that, that you're recognized for that because you are the guiding spirit behind this. So before we start, what we're going to ask people to do, we're just going to go right down the line and ask um, people to just um, introduce themselves and just say how why you are involved in, um, you know, all the work that we're doing here. So I'm going to start with you, Sergeant Blackie. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Detective or Sergeant uh, Mike Zalecki with the Franklin Police Department. I uh, apologize. I recently left um, Detectives where I was a narcotic guy here in town for uh, the last two and a half years. Uh, I got involved with SAFE right when I um, went into Detectives. Uh, kind of had an interest with the opioids and narcotics. Um, prior to that, I got trained as a drug recognition expert here in town and worked uh, throughout the county with that, uh, evaluating people. So seeing the impacts outside of town and then being fortunate enough to work with the families in town, uh, I was able to kind of get a good bond and save, um, kind of guide uh, as many people as we could into recovery and treatment. So uh, saves a great program and uh, save them for uh, the years to come. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua Hanna. I'm the principal here at Franklin High School. I've uh, spent the last 25 years working with high school age students as a coach or a teacher, and now as an administrator. Uh, and I've personally, through family and friends, and also as an educator, seen the struggle of mental health and substance use uh, with young people. And uh, I'm proud to be a part of an organization that's thinking forward regarding how are we going to interact with the the needs that are in front of us, rather than, as an example, suspending students out of school and expecting the problem to go away, coming up with solutions to help support that. Um, and from my experience, we all care about the young people in our community. And with this um, 
wealth of knowledge, we're going to continue to refine our practices to make sure less and less have to go through some of the struggles that we've all uh, experienced. Hi, everybody. I think you know who I am. Jen Knight Levine, Safe Coalition Executive Director and Co-Founder. Great to be here. Thanks, and I'll just sit, uh, introduce myself, Ian Bergen, as was mentioned, and just um, my in interest, um, I've been an educator in Franklin, was an educator, at, um, elementary principal, middle school principal, and a member of the Substance Abuse Task Force um, as a former member of the uh, school committee. And, and I'm just passionate about the work that this group is doing, and I'm so proud to be here tonight, and that's it. All right. Hi, my name is Dan Lagars. I'm a volunteer for the SAFE Coalition. I'm 27 years old and I am a recovering alcoholic. Um, I am currently 31 months sober and I grew up in... Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you to the SAFE Coalition. Um, I grew up in Sunbury, Mass. and. Uh, I love everything that the Safe Coalition does, all the issues they address I have gone through, and I try to use my experience to uh, shine some light on some ways we can address them and better navigate the situations that, that you know we're dealing with. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Jim Derrick. I am the parent of a son who struggles. I have three boys. Uh, my son walked these halls, well actually they were the old high school halls, about 15 years ago. And uh, as a result, uh, I found myself quite lost in the environment, trying to find anybody just to talk to, let alone to get quality help. When one evening I sat in the fourth row here and watched many of the people here, including Jen and Jeff Roy, uh, hold the first meeting of what would become the SAFE Coalition, and I became a co-founder of that organization. I am grateful for that. I am grateful for this school system, which in my experience has, uh, has leaned into this problem and created so many safety nets for our children today. Um, and I'm just very, very proud to be on the Substance Abuse Task Force and serve with you all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Wendy Cohen. I'm on the board of SAFE and I serve as the medical director. I'm a primary care physician. Um, I live in Foxborough and I have two young kids in the school there. And I was kind of brought into SAFE as they were trying to figure out how to be able to distribute Narcan to uh, families who have a loved one or anyone who may be a witness to an overdose and was just so impressed by the dedication and thought process that everyone around the table at SAFE was going through and the cooperation that I just dug in and haven't left. <laughs> Uh, good evening. My name is Jeff Roy, and I am the state representative for Franklin and Medway. And um, as I sat in this seat, I got uh, a, a flashback to uh, June 30th of 2015 when we held that uh, first panel. Um, I was the lucky recipient of an email from Jennifer Knight in October of 2014 uh, talking about is there something we could do for the Franklin community uh, to bring awareness to uh, substance use disorder. And uh, she just wanted to start a small group uh, that people could go to as a uh, resource. And uh, that has grown into this uh, safe coalition uh, organization. And I frequently say to Jen, uh, when I see all of the great things that the safe coalition has done, I frequently say to her, Jen, is this what you, is this what you had in mind when you wanted to start a small group? Uh, she's uh, done a phenomenal job along with Jim, and I met Jim on that June 30th, uh, 2015 evening. Uh, and I say, uh, at the state level, uh, this is one of the most difficult issues uh, that we deal with uh, regularly, and uh, I will talk tonight about some of the things that we are doing as a state to address this. The good news I'm going to share before we even get into that um, nationally, Overdoses are up to the extent of 31%. In Massachusetts, we're up 1%. But we still have a problem here, but uh, we are addressing it. We are addressing it uh, uh, with events like this. So we are having some positive results. Great. I guess we're ready to start. I'm 
I'm just going to frame the first question just a little bit, but, um, to put it in perspective a little bit. Uh, we know that substance use, misuse, is most often a way to soothe emotional pain, and it's just a symptom. Other symptoms of emotional turmoil are cutting, eating disorders, suicidal ideation, and even perfectionism. Too often we hear substance abuse really has nothing to do with me or my family, but this emotional pain is sparing many of our young people, many coming from loving, caring families. They are among our honor students, our athletes, spanning all socioeconomic levels. It is tough out there for so many of our kids for so many different reasons. They often try to protect us from their pain. But one thing we know for sure, they have become very good at hiding it. So I'm gonna start with Dan, and I'm gonna thank you so much for being so courageous enough to come share your story, because the power of sharing stories is what is so important. One thing that the task force wanted um, you to share with all of us, is sort of based on your experience, what would have been helpful for us as teachers and parents to have known what was missed along the way? We want you just to go a little bit deeper into your story and maybe share especially what could have been helpful to you and what would have made a difference. So would you mind sharing that for us tonight, Dan? Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Danny and I'm an alcoholic. Um, my first drink was last day of eighth grade and I fell in love with it right from the start. Um, and going, out, going through high school, um, that's when my drinking and, and substance use really picked up. And in my mind, an alcoholic or an addict was someone you see under a bridge with a cigarette it wasn't a 16-year-old kid from a great family with no history of substance abuse. But that's just because I didn't know anything about this problem. So I thought it was normal to drink and get in trouble. And the more I drank, uh, the more opportunities that were taken for me, like getting kicked off the sports team and getting into better colleges. And um, one thing I wish, you know, that parents um, or teachers would have seen, uh, you know, is, is really communication. Um, every time I was struggling, I felt like I was alone. Um, I felt like I didn't fit in. And one way to help that was to drink and, and use because that made me feel better. And every time I did that, I would get in trouble and it would just be punishment and more punishment and more punishment. And for me, that wasn't a way to fix it because I had a problem and I had nobody to talk to about it and I was afraid to talk, to, to talk about it because I thought I was either gonna get in trouble or I would look like a weak person because I was struggling. So for me, communication and, and love is really um, something I wish it, that it would have really helped me, for sure. Jim, um, you've been so courageous in sharing your story, sort of the agonizing role of being a parent of a young man whose life has been so di disrupted by the disease, disease of substance use. When you look back and reflect, um, were there things that you wish you had known, things that, that might have been missed along the way? Can you, can you speak a little bit about that to us? Yeah, I sure can, Ann. Um, <clears throat> you know, part of this process for me was really very humbling, to say the least. Um, I was the dad that figured, hey, you know, if you do everything right, in my mind, I was playing ball, getting the dog, getting the picket fence, making sure you go to church now and then, you know do the best you can and that everything's fine and the apples shine up nicely and then they go off to college and life takes care of itself. And of course, that's just not reality. So um, some of the things that I really, really wish that I had paid attention to have to do with very, very early developmental stages when I could see things like anxiety, when I could see um, a real sense of uh, not belonging in my son. And at the time, I, I equated that with a behavioral problem. So what did it look like? My son might uh, refuse to participate in activities with other children. And so at six or eight years old, I'd say, what, you know, he's a pain in the neck. Look at this kid. He's just doing this for attention, you know. Um, as he got older, <clears throat> he may not uh, agree to come downstairs if we had family over for dinner. And, you know, what I saw that as is, is attention-seeking. 
and really took a disciplinary uh, response to that when there were clear signs along the way that my son was suffering, uh, and he was. And so he turned to self-medicating. Um, and in the schools, it was a much different time. I don't blame the schools back then, but it was just a different time. We, we weren't looking the way we are today for early indicators. We didn't have a substance abuse task force that was focused on the social and emotional wellness of our kids, which is, you know, today is such a different landscape. And it's why I want to be part of this conversation because I want to urge parents to be part, to join with the people that are working on your behalf, like they're up here at the stage, and be part of the solution. Don't assume that your children at home that are exhibiting behavioral problems are just fine. Don't do what I did and, and feel that the third rail of life would be if your son or daughter suffers from mental health uh, concerns, and so therefore, like me, pretend that it's not happening. Um, we spend so much time in looking for organic food and trying to keep our kids healthy in so many ways. We, gosh, buying a car, I would spend hours and weeks and months researching cars, but I spend very, very little time thinking about or working with my children around the issues of mental health and mental hygiene. And honestly, it was because I was afraid. It was fear. It was fear that if my son or daughter was suffering, that therefore that must say something bad about me. And I'm just here to assure you that's not the case. So reach out, grab on to any of these lifelines, there's plenty of them, and uh, ask for help. And know critically that you're not alone. I'm, I'm just gonna remind people, anyone on Zoom uh, at home, please mute because it's coming in and it's, uh, it's impacting the, uh, the brilliant thoughts that are coming forward here. So. Do, um, Dr. Cohn, can you add to that in terms of your wealth of experience and what you see in terms of things that parents should be looking for, sort of at a younger age, before things get out of control? Can you speak to a little bit about that? Yeah, it's hard to follow these yeah. two, <laughs> uh, because it, it, I could have, I basically wrote down exactly what, what you guys are talking about, but I don't know if anyone is familiar with Dr. Ross Green, but his his premise is kids do well if they can. And so in the young kids, if that kid is acting out or misbehaving, it may be annoying as a parent, it may be annoying as a teacher. Your knee-jerk reaction is, is consequence and punishment. But the really important question is why. That kid is going, that kid wants usually to comply with your expectations. They want to succeed. They want to feel good about themselves. And if they're not meeting your expectations, there's something else going on. So if, whether you're a parent or a teacher, talk to the kid alone. Know that, let them know that all of their feelings are valid, that maybe, it, maybe they may be feeling worried or left out or bullied overwhelmed, wanting to fit in, until we start really addressing the why of the behavior problems, we're really failing the students and our own kids. The next area that the, the um, task force really wanted to hone in on was um, getting just a, a, just a no holds bar realistic look at what's happening out in the community relative to substance abuse. Use, it's misuse, it's impact, what's going on. Uh, we know it's not unique to Franklin. Um, and certainly as we get to the end of this panel discussion, we're gonna talk about solutions and what we should be doing maybe to do more. But right now, we have to tell it like it is. And what are you seeing? So I'm gonna start with Sergeant Kalecki, can you, So locally, uh, what we're seeing here, I'll just give you some stats. Uh, with, at the police department, we work with a mental health clinician, and she does calls, uh, mental health related and substance abuse related. Uh, so just in, just in this month alone, uh, we've had 10 calls for service involving uh, individuals going through a mental health crisis. Five of those uh, individuals were 18 and under. And of those kids that were 18 and under, four of them got transported to the hospital. Um, 
Now on the follow-up side of the house, where it's not a call for service, but say somebody will reach out to the PD and say, hey, is there someone um, uh, a loved one or a friend can talk to? Um, our clinician will go out and speak with the family. Um, and she's done 30 of those follow-ups, and again, 15 of those involve kids under 18. Um, the, the mental health stuff right now, especially post-COVID, uh, we're seeing as a, it's played a huge impact on our mental health calls. Um, the, the kids that we're dealing with, um, a lot of them during COVID, they got sucked into the, the social media side of the house. They saw friends and um, social media uh, uh, personalities getting into vaping, THC. So they would reach out here in town, which uh, unfortunately is not a hard thing to do through social media. And they'd get into those you know, vape pens, dabs, uh, TH, THC products. And they'd kind of like almost feel like a community in those groups. And then that would be their outlet. A lot of what we saw and what we continue to see is, uh, you know, these, these kids, they come home from school, they go in their house, they go in their rooms, and there's no family interaction. Um, we were at a call uh, two nights ago. Um, the girl, she's, she was, uh, she's a freshman. She had a 70 inch screen TV in her, in her living room. Mom had a 70 inch screen, 70 inch screen TV in her living room. And there was a little, like, 12 inch screen in the living room. Sorry, in their bedrooms they had the big TVs and in, the, in the living room there was like a little 12 inch TV. So which means there was no, there's no social connection between the parents. Um, and she's unfortunately going through a tough time at this. So um, I would say that the, you know, you get these kids that are they're getting into substance abuse here in town, but um, it, it's starting, like Jim was saying and everybody else was saying, it's starting at the house at an earlier age where there's some type of disconnect and they, they get attracted to these, um, these outlets where they can kind of feel like they're part of a group. Uh, just real quick, the, uh, the CDC and the Human Health Services, um, they, they put in some risk factors for substance abuse. Uh, you know, a history, uh, a history of family substance abuse puts somebody at high risk, but uh, poor parental monitoring um, and lack of social, or lack of school connectedness were two big points that they, they touched upon that kind of accelerate somebody to get into substance abuse. Um, whereas the prevention of it um, would be family and parental engagement with the kids, uh, family support, monitoring, and then you know, have, having parents connected with the schools. Because the teachers are a great resource to have with your kids. They might leave the house chipper, and then the moment they come into these, these schools, they might get that sudden jolt of anxiety, and they can be a different kid. And then by the time you see them, when you get home from work at, say, 4 or 5 o'clock, they could be, you know, already taking their vape pens or THC pens, and now they're, you're getting a whole different kid than what left the house. So uh, those are just a couple of things um, that we certainly see on a daily basis here with, with our calls with uh, involving youth. Mr. Hannon, can you tell us how, what, what kinds of things you've seen going on that, that are, they play out in schools, they don't start in schools, but they show up in schools. What are the kind of things that you're seeing that, that the community needs to be aware of? Um, yeah, it's a good question. And what we're seeing is something brand new. Um, and like I said, 25 years of working in a high school, none of us have seen behavior nationally or regionally or even in this building like we've seen the last few months. Uh, and it's a result of an extended period of time where adolescents weren't experiencing the normal uh, feedback that they'd be receiving from their teachers and advisors and coaches. And uh, that's just what we're seeing, like, behaviorally. And we know that a lot of that behavior is a result of how they're feeling internally, which is probably confused, scared, frustrated, and many other uh, emotions. Um, you know, a message I want to share with, with this audience, both at home and here together, is part of the frustration that teenagers have and what drives them to use is they're feeling as though they're letting people down. Um, and I think as a school and as a community and as a family, we're constantly trying to challenge and to have high expectations, but also support. And striking that balance isn't easy. So as a parent or as a school, we want to believe that they can meet the standards that we've set. 
But we also need to realize that if they don't, that's okay. And I feel like we get caught up in this race for achievement, whether it be a team or a school or uh, some type of recognition. And without that, we're disappointed and our, and our students and our children feel that disappointment. Whether we say it explicitly or not, they'll see it in our own body language. And I'm not suggesting that we throw all of our standards out the window, because I don't think that that's a very healthy approach. But what I am suggesting is we take a look at the reality of the difference between someone making that team or not, or getting that honor or not, and what ends up happening in their entire life. Because the studies that have been done across the country show that there's very little correlation between one's overall success and these achievements that we put so much uh, priority on. And so for me, that's one of the things I think we can all work on doing. Is, is realizing that they, to the point earlier, they're trying their best. We want to honor them. Um, and when we see increased use of vape uh, in our schools, as we have vape detectors in all of our bathrooms, and we're collecting evidence daily about the use that's going on there. Uh, when we see and hear of, of addiction uh, problems within our community and, and use excessive use of alcohol and drugs, we know that that's happening because we are missing the mark with supporting our, our students in their own ego, their own self-worth. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm feeling, that's what I'm seeing, and it's at a much higher rate over the last few months because of what we had to go through for the 18 months previous. Uh, as a school, we're organizing ourselves to respond to this crisis, but that's not really the design of this institution. And so in full, um, just being blatantly honest, it's a struggle. We have great staff that are committed to this work, and we're trying to um, triage where we can, but the, the, the struggle is real, for sure. Uh, but I think if we're open and honest about it, and we prioritize the love that we have for, our, for your own children and for our community, that's the best first step for it. That's great, Jen. Jen, do you want to add to that? Because you're, you're out there a lot, and you know what's, what's going on. Yeah, certainly. So, um, you know, we at the Safe Coalition, we um, sometimes we have folks who call us and say that they'd like education and support, um, or we have referrals from the school department or from police and fire. And, you know, in our experience, I think that there's three real crucial things that we're seeing within the town of Franklin and, and the immediate surrounding communities. So for almost every adolescent that we've met with at the Safe Coalition, every single one of them has tried to stop or decrease their use. So I think sometimes when we think about our students and our children using substances, we assume that they are dedicated to using the substance. And what we've seen is that all these kids, when I talk to them about what their use is and have they ever tried to stop, all of them have tried. And it highlights again how much power these substances have over our kiddos. They don't want to be using a substance that impacts their body and brain negatively. They don't want to disappoint their families. They don't want to be kicked off sports teams. And yet, when they've tried alone by themselves, they haven't been successful. But to me, that shows incredible courage and strength and the desire to want something different for their life. The second thing in Franklin specifically is that we've seen so many more kids buying from dealers in town as opposed to like a friend. And for me, and I think um, Sergeant uh, Kalecki have, I keep saying detective, sorry, Kalecki, <laughs> have really noticed is, you know, talking with our students about safety, environmental safety and environmental risks. And two years ago, we weren't having these conversations. When we were talking with kids about buying, we were talking with them about what they were buying and the quantity, and now we're talking with kids about, you know, if you are 13 and you're going into a 19-year-old a male's car, where are you going? What are you doing? Why is he giving you a birthday present? Those are conversations that we weren't having. And the last piece really is that parental piece. Um, what we're seeing in Franklin right now is a, a huge increase in parents supplying alcohol and THC products to their children. Um, and you know, I don't think that that's new, um, but I do want to make sure that I, I bring that up because we're seeing that right now. Thank you. Jim, you were gonna add something to that? Sure, just briefly. Um, I just wanted to say that in addition to uh, our loved ones that are suffering directly, that is students in the case of what Josh was speaking about or any of our loved ones, um, this, this substance use disorder and mental illness take on, take a, messes with the family dynamic and causes strain within the family that needs to be reckoned with. And I consider myself to be a parent in long-term recovery. Um, 
from codependency as a result of my son's struggle and that my recovery is independent of his recovery and I say that um, it took me a long time to figure out how the, his illness had impacted my entire family and how sick I had become as a result of, uh, of loving someone who was an addict and suffering. And so I just want families to know, anybody that's listening, whether you're a family or a loved one or a friend of, uh, know that we have support. I am the Director of Family Recovery for the Coalition based on my lived experience of what is what I'm best qualified for. And we really want to welcome you into this conversation. You need your own care. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go on to the, the third question. We know that mental health issues and substance misuse um, was an epidemic before COVID struck. It's been made much worse since then. There are not enough services for individuals and families seeking support. Demand is most certainly exceeding supply. We know from the town council meeting last night that there is a waiting list for families who are unhoused. Research shows that 20 to 25 percent of unhoused are suffering from mental health issues. We have a huge crisis. Turning to our illustrious state representative, Jeffrey Roy, one of the forces behind the Safe Coalition and one of its biggest advocates. Um, Jeff, can you tell us what's happening at the state level to address the crisis of both mental health and substance use, prevention, education, intervention? Just tell us what you got. Got it all. All the answers are there. Um, first of all, let me uh, explain. So Massachusetts has a budget of $47.6 billion. It's a lot of dollars. 56% of that budget goes to the Health and Human Services line item in the budget. So that's $26.5 billion that we spend on human services in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that absorbs uh, both the mental health and substance use uh, issues. Um, I can tell you that in the FY22 budget that we just passed uh, in April and was signed by the governor in July, uh, we increased the total investment in substance use uh, uh, by, uh, to $408 million. And that's a 22% increase over the last fiscal year, and it's up 242% uh, since 2015. So uh, we've more than doubled the amount of money that we're spending on substance use uh, disorder uh, in the budget. So that's one of the pieces that uh, the state, uh, how it addresses these problems is through uh, uh, line items in the budget. Another thing, uh, we passed two comprehensive substance use pieces of legislation uh, in the, the most recent being in 2016. And uh, to try and uh, deal with uh, mental health parity in insurance, uh, to try to deal with uh, licensing of uh, recovery homes and a, and a whole slew of, uh, of issues that uh, come up in this particular space. Um, you know, one of the other uh, line items that we have uh, put in the state budget, uh, we've gotten approximately $300,000 over the last uh, uh, five years for the SAFE Coalition, and uh, we will continue uh, to provide that funding uh, for the great work that's being uh, done. Uh, and finally, I want to tell you about uh, some legislation that was passed by the Massachusetts Senate just yesterday. And uh, that bill will be making its way over to the House. But I think it addresses a lot of the issues that we have seen over the past few years. So, uh, and it was a unanimous vote, 39 to nothing. Uh, so that bill will guarantee Massachusetts residents are eligible for an annual mental health wellness exams at no cost. You get a... Uh, a, a primary care physician who does your annual physical exam at no cost, we are going to direct that your mental health be treated uh, similarly. Uh, it's going to create an online portal to smooth the uh, transition uh, from emergency care to longer term care. We see uh, folks with mental health issues are being 
aborted in our emergency rooms. That not only uh, lessens the supply of emergency room services, but no treatment is being provided to that patient in an emergency room who has urgent mental health needs. So we're going to uh, uh, provide a portal uh, there. Uh, it uh, will establish a panel to resolve barriers to care for children with complex behavioral health needs who find themselves also in an, in an emergency room. And this stuff does cost money. And we're going to dedicate, uh, or at least uh, the Senate has dedicated, and uh, I'm sure that the House uh, will do something similar. It's $122 million to support uh, nearly 2,000 behavioral uh, professionals. Uh, so the other important piece is that it's going to enforce the mental health parity laws. We've had mental health parity laws on the books for years, but I don't know how many of you have uh, attempted to get mental health services, and uh, you're not getting them as if, uh, you know, if you uh, break, uh, break a bone and you go into a hospital, there's no uh, question you're gonna get the treatment that you need. We haven't seen the parity reach the level uh, for mental health, and this bill is going to ensure that health care for mental health is treated equally for other med medical conditions. So that's the ways that, uh, you know, just some of the ways that we can uh, contribute uh, as a statement to this problem. And I'll go back to the point I made uh, early on that, uh, you know, while we've seen a 31% increase in substance use uh, um, uh, issues and overdoses nationwide. Massachusetts is in the single digits, which tells me and should tell you uh, that we are having an impact in this space, but we have a long way to go. And uh, thank God we have uh, folks that are on this uh, panel here tonight who are dedicated to this issue and who continue uh, to do things because we will get folks on the uh, pathway to recovery. And I remember in 2015, the number of deaths that we saw uh, for persons between the ages of 20 and 30, it was off the charts. Um, we're not seeing that uh, level of deaths in 2021, which is promising because you can't get into recovery if you're dead and providing a pathway to recovery, what is what the state is dedicated to and what every person on this panel here is dedicated to, and I'm sure in your own homes and being in this audience tonight, that's what you want to see as well. And I'm going to have to sneak yeah. out. I do have one more meeting tonight, uh, but uh, thank you for being here. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. And then finally, our, our last uh, question of the evening. Um, we, we have seen that our kids are suffering from emotional turmoil for many reasons, and certainly made worse by the pandemic. We have seen how substance use is impacting our community, what's happening. We are seeing how it's impacting life at school, what's happening there. And we know that just right now, there simply are not enough services but it's important that we start to look to some of the solutions, some of the resources, some of the ways that we can make a difference right now, and we are making a difference right now. So I'm gonna ask Jen if, if you can um, speak sort of to the mental health aspect. Um, how might we as parents engage with our kids to get a better sense of what's going on with them? Um, understanding that for many reasons, communication can be difficult. You have some great skills in that. I wonder if you could share that with parents now. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, the age-old question, how do you talk with your middle school and high school and have a really great conversation? I mean, that's, that's challenging on a good day. Um, and so what we at the Safe Coalition continue to really focus on is coming alongside your child in a calm manner and opening up a conversation by inviting your child in and explaining to them that you love them and that you care about them, regardless, just as Josh had mentioned before, of what they are accomplishing that day or that night or their accolades on the sports field or in the academic classroom. That you love your child, you care about your child, you want to be with your child, and you are recognizing that something has shifted in your home. 
I say that, and I, my hope is that when I say that there's an understanding that planting seeds within relationships are crucial. So it may take a few times of connecting with your child and reminding them that you love them and that you care about them and that you want to have a conversation with them about something that's off or that has shifted in the household. And it may take a few times for your child to open up. So we really focus on open-ended questions, really affirming what they're saying, reflecting the conversation that you both are having, and then kind of summarizing this style of conversation. What we've heard from families is that sitting next to your child is really important instead of sitting in front of them. Sitting next to them where you're close enough and you're not in an authoritative higher stance is important. That over and over again, creating a routine of communication. So whether that means you pick your child up every day from practice or from high school and you have a conversation for five minutes, or you sit down every night for dinner and you have a conversation, or maybe it's the next morning and you have a conversation, but consistent routines with conversation that invites love and care instead of expectation is crucial to setting the framework to remind your child that you are open to having those conversations. None of this is easy, and so we do invite any of you who are thinking about having a conversation to talk with any of us on the stage, and especially myself and Jim, um, because you aren't alone. And if you feel like you need a little bit of modeling or practice before you have these conversations, we're always more than open to, to doing that. Excellent, thank you. Um, before I um, ask Josh um, about what um, happening in the schools, I was gonna ask, um, Sajid Flecky, if you could, advice that you would give to parents, what, what you think that, um, based on what you see on a day-to-day -day basis, what, what advice, what would you want parents to know from a police perspective? What would be helpful to you in, in dealing with everything that you have to deal with? Sure, uh, so we see a lot with parents, uh, you know, we go to a lot of overdoses, parents, uh, they have the same response, like either I didn't know um, what they were doing, or um, I knew, but he's my kid, I didn't really want to call him out. Um, so my advice to the parents would be, you have to have those tough conversations with your, with your kids. I mean, you know them best, better than anybody. You know, um, a lot of times parents kind of don't want to be the bad guy. Um, they don't want to kind of set some things off, but they don't want to press the issue. They'll take, um, you know, they, they might take a white lie, like, oh, are you doing this? No, I'm not. All right, he said he's not, so I believe him. Um, if you think something's going on, you, you, I'm not saying you gotta like full court press him, but do some digging. If you, if you have a problem with that, that's okay. Um, you have the safe coalition, you have us at the PD. Like I said, we, we have a clinician who's not uniformed. She's, she's great. Um, we can kind of give you some advice or you know, we can come in and have that conversation with, uh, with your child. Um, but the, the, the conversations need to happen. Um, a lot of times these, these kids, they just, they can run rampant and the parents just don't want to, they just don't want to be that bad guy. So that would be my advice to, to the parents. And also, we kind of know what the, um, what the common denominator here is, whether it's THC, vapes, or different types of, of substances. I would say to just do a little homework on what these look like, what they smell like, um, how they can get them. You know, we're seeing kids get them in the mail. Uh, they're, they're having friends. You know, if you have a, a kid in junior high um, and all of a sudden a friend's driving up and you run outside to the driver real quick and then they're back in the house in 15 seconds, they're probably not talking about homework uh, in the driveway. So um, just kind of sense all that stuff and uh, just do some homework and see what's out there and how they can kind of conceal it so you can kind of be on like the, the tip of the spear with that. That's really about it. Thank you. Josh, how about kind of what's going on in the high school, the sources, the sources of the support that are there and how you work with parents and how parents can reach out to you and all work together on this. Can you speak sure. to that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, first, just to say uh, thank you all for coming and tuning in tonight. Uh, sometimes these messages end up feeling like this is what you need to do. The fact that you're here and paying attention means we're already halfway there. Um, and that to me is a great step. So um, beyond that, in terms of like using the school as a resource, certainly don't hesitate to reach out. I think, you know, I was at an MIA conference 
this morning getting trained up on the principal roles of following their expectations and guidance. One of the more interesting bullets that was shared was if a family comes forward with a substance problem, that is not going to be a violation. That's going to be an opportunity for the school to support. Oftentimes the school gets connected with families around alcohol or drug or vape use after the fact. And then there's a lot of frustration and emotion because now we're talking about suspensions from participation. And I wonder if families, if they knew ahead of time, hey, if I bring this up, the school can help support what we are feeling or what we're seeing or what we're sensing. But we can work together to avoid those really dramatic moments where the police report comes in and now we're, we're into a hearing around you know, why this season is going to be cut short. And so I guess one important message I would share is if your senses are that you might need a little extra help, please ask for it ahead of time because we have resources here with the Safe Coalition and within our own teams to try to help put together some plans um, to get proactive in this. And none of it's a surprise. The one most consistent thing, like I said over the years, is that you know, adolescents struggle with uh, safe decision making and they're likely gonna find themselves in difficult spots and we've gotta be, we're getting more proactive thankfully, but that's not gonna change. That's the way that their brain is developed. And so I think for us, if we see it, let's not be embarrassed about it. Let's, let's call it out for what it is. We have a lot of brave people here who've said that same thing. Like, bear our discomfort and let's work together as a team so our lines are always open to be to take that proactive step and i think if we can get comfortable with that we'll probably be looking at avoiding a lot of uncomfortable moments absolutely thank you before we talk about local resources um dr Cohen, can you speak a little bit about um the sources and support that that you provide at um through your role and and how people might reach out to you and can you speak a little bit about that Early intervention. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, if we're thinking about how we can intervene in this process earlier mm -hmm. before a problem develops, um, my advice would be start the conversation way before you think the kid is going to need it. The nine, ten year old, let them know you're interested and open to all of their feelings, not just the happy ones. Uh, normalize eating and asking for help with feelings and, and mental health. Also, watch your words uh, and your actions. Kids hear everything. And be careful not to propagate stigma towards people struggling with mental health and substance use. I'm sure it's unintentional, but it comes into our language a lot and you don't even realize it. Model healthy ways to cope with stress. Ask, ask for help. Parenting is incredibly hard. Everyone needs help at some point, and you will truly be surprised how many people have been in your shoes, even though you may think it's the most shameful thing that you're, you're dealing with. Once we can start talking about it, it, just, it opens up a lot of avenues for help. Talk to your um, family doctor, your pediatrician. Um, they can have resources in the community if they don't know, if they don't seem super up on what the local resources are. There's a program called MCSTAP, M-C-S-T-A-P, that is a state-run program that serves as a consult service for any primary care physician who wants some advice on how to help their patients with uh, substance use problems. Um, one thing that I always talk with the teams, especially at their well visits with the parent there is to let your kids know that if they're any ever anywhere that they feel unsafe or pressured to do something that they don't want to do that you will come pick them up anytime day or night no questions asked i even i suggest you develop a code phrase that they can text or call you with so if you get the text mom i'm not going to be home in time to feed the dog that means your reply is, where are you? I'm coming to get you now. It allows your kid to save face in front of whomever they're with. And the same, I'm controlling mom, as being such a, just coming to get me. 
but it lets them get out of a situation that they're not comfortable in and that may be dangerous for them. <laughs> That's very helpful, thank you. Lucas, did you want to say something about... Yes, um, can I jump on that? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to join the panel with your permission. Well, uh, right. okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, sir. So, um, I just want to thank all of you, Ms. Panelists and Dr. Burden, for facilitating in the context to the questions matters. And I think you hit on so many great points. I had a few notes that I took to follow up just as kind of bad and clean up on some of the panel discussion. Um, one thing that Mr. Hannah brought up was around the schools and the support that we have for our schools. Um, we've also just piloted, we mentioned this at school committee last year around the PASS model, which is a positive alternative to suspension. And what we've piloted for is when students have a substance use violation within our school or on a school event. Um, what we've learned is you can't punish addiction out of someone. And uh, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Cohen mentioned the negative stigma and uh, the stigma, stigmatization of mental health or substance use and, and what that looks like. One thing we've learned is trying to, if we can balance and approach those types of violations from a treatment perspective, trying to determine what does this person need, what is it telling us. So we've balanced our, our suspensions um, with a treatment option. And when I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks around Gen counseling our students, that's an example. So we have a student at Franklin High School who engages in using substances and we learn of it and it's a violation of our code of conduct. Principal Hanna works through his process and has met with, at the table with families. And I can think of, you mentioned 25 years in education, Josh, sitting across the table and suspending for 10 days, 25 days, and saying you use drugs, you're out. And now we've taken a student who we just heard all about this isolation and not feeling like they belong, and we've just told them you're gonna be out for 25 days. And I don't see how that ever uh, would solve something, but I'm proud to say now um, we've really opened our eyes and really tried to listen. And we listen to the science, we try to stay up to date and stay educated on this work, and this is one example of it to hear from all the experts here. But we've taken a treatment model where if a parent's at that table, Principal Hannah can say, you know, this is typically a 10 day suspension, but if you're willing to participate, your family and you participate in Safe Coalition, work with Jim, work with Jen, other councils they have on staff, to really try to get to the root of what's happening here. We'll work with you on that and try to create a model that is sustainable and leads to actually effective change for people who we know are hurting. Um, so I just wanted to hit on that. The last thing um, I wanted to mention on this note is the ride home. You mentioned conversations. We're about to get to resources. I think you want to close up, Jim. You're gonna, you're gonna close, the, close it up. The ride home. You mentioned it a few times on heard conversations. There's great information in here that you can take one when you leave, and we have a lot available for those at home who uh, may wish to get one. We'll have them out in schools. We have them in our office at, at Central Office, and we can put them in the municipal building on the bottom floor as well. So, Jim. Thank you, Lucas, very much. Um, I was asked to comment on local resources, and, and I think this is a perfect segue because I've been had a seat at the Franklin uh, substance abuse task force table now for the better part of three or four years since its existence and for those of you that don't know what the substance abuse task force is you're looking at part of it but it's also other community stakeholders and students we have some wonderful student representatives here you guys are over there who are actively involved in, and share with us so freely about what's going on with them and their peers and their struggles and their unique um, and, and their unique perspective which which after all it's all the time about. Um, so it's so good to have them. And the reason I focus on this is because I'm often asked by people, uh, how's Franklin doing? Um, you know, residents. Um, and I can tell you that as somebody who works in multiple communities, I, again, I'm a dad, I'm not a professional. I'm just a taxpayer here in Franklin. I am so proud of this school system, of Lucas's leadership, Mr. Hanna, Sarah Hearn, the, the administration for the way they've handled this. And the reason I'm proud is because my son, as I said, walked through this system when there were no safety nets.
It's not anyone's fault, it was just a different time. And the way this town has responded in the past five years is remarkable. And the reason I say that isn't just to blow smoke, it's to say that that's the resource. You're looking at the resources. You, you, have, a, a, you have empowered and leveled up the uh, education in, in, your, in, your faculty, in your teachers and in your counselors and in, in your openness, the way you speak, Josh, so candidly and, and you're so approachable um, with honesty and authenticity. And it, it's just an environment that I'm just proud to be a resident here. And, and if my son or daughter was in this school, I would be leaning into this with all these folks before there was a problem. So that brings me to my next point. Again, I mentioned about buying a car and how much attention I, I give to that. Um, I would be um, really leaning in with my uh, children uh, to resources before I need them. So I might sit with Jen, if it were me, uh, or with someone on staff here and, and have a conversation. Not so much just, if, if there's no problems, there's no problems, but maybe just to get some information. One of the things I've worked with the police more than I probably wanted to over the years, but um, recently, very happily. And I heard Mike Kalecki say, and I hear him say it all the time, we need our parents to be educated. We need them, you know, we've got 35 or 40 people here, we'd like to see three or 400 people here, okay? Um, no one's fault, it's just, it's just that's, what, that's what I think it's called for. Um, would, would you agree, Mike? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and you see the, the other end of it, as do we. So, uh, please reach out to anybody in the schools, the Safe Coalition in Gen, the police are our partners in all of this, uh, and do an incredible job at helping folks access treatment. And um, I think that's it. But uh, we are always open for a conversation. The Safe Coalition number is 508-488-8105 for anybody that's watching on TV, and you know where to get uh, these fine folks in the schools. So thank you, man. Sorry, just to touch real quick what you were saying. Um, when I talk about our mental health clinician, she's part of our jail diversion program. So if you call us up and, you're, and you're, um, your child has an issue with substance abuse or anything like that, we're not looking to, you know, put them through the criminal justice system and take them to court and, you know, have have this kind of, uh, this chain drag with them throughout their life. Um, what we're trying to do is kind of like assess the situation and get them the help that they need immediately um, and deal with the, whatever issue they have, whether it's mental health or substance abuse or both, when they're a kid, so when they do become an adult, they don't have this um, this past that kind of falls on haunts them, and they kind of revert to the same stuff they did when they were a kid. So uh, if you do need help from the police, just keep that in mind. They're not here to, they're not here to kind of, you know, get a stat and arrest with your, with your child. We're trying to get them the help that they need. So when we see them 18, 19, 20 years old, um, we'll be like, oh, they, you know, that panned out very well. That, uh, that person. So just, just wanted to reiterate that. Jen, I was just going to ask you one quick thing. Um, our friend Megan um, made an incredibly powerful public service announcement and she had an important message to share with the community. Could you summarize that? Because that was so important and I just want to reiterate it before we leave tonight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So, um, you know, something that we have recognized throughout the last year and a half at the Safe Coalition has been an increase in individuals experiencing an overdose and oftentimes an overdose fatality and they aren't alone. And when we talk with folks who have been around someone who's experienced an overdose fatality, the consistent message we hear is that they are scared to call. They're scared to call because they don't want the police involved. They're scared to call because they already have a record. They're scared to call because there's a warrant. Um, and at the end of the day, that fear has now placed someone out of their lives for the rest of their lives. And almost everyone that we've connected with has been married, has had, maybe has had children, has had a job, but certainly has had a social network. And what we know, you know, especially in the statistics that came out yesterday is that overdoses are increasing. And the message that Dr. Bergen um, is highlighting is um, always call 911 that those folks who are experiencing an overdose cannot be saved by driving quickly to the hospital. They can be saved by Narcan on hand and by first responders like the police and fire and EMS who have Narcan with them. What we're seeing right now is that much of the um, pressed pills and um, 
even some of the flower weed that we're seeing does have fentanyl. And fentanyl is incredibly fast acting and needs as many doses of Narcan. So the message here is if you are around anyone who may experience an overdose, please one, get yourself Narcan trained and have Narcan on hand. Secondarily, call 911. We want to make sure that that person has the most opportunity to say yes to recovery and that you are not alone with someone passing away. It's an excruciating, traumatizing experience for you, whether that person lives or dies, and there is help. The Good Samaritan Law covers you, and so the message here is get yourself some Narcan, get yourself Narcan trained, and it's 2021. Do not be afraid to call 911. into the smaller groups, and there's a hidden plate site bedroom over here. Um, there are a few resources. So the Ride Home booklet, which was mentioned earlier, is fabulous. It really is a beautiful, easy to read guide about how to have conversations with your child in those small little moments that maybe you're driving them to practice or dropping them off at school. The, um, the Substance Abuse Task Force website, you can click on that, um, and that has all information about the Franklin Public Schools Substance Abuse Task Force. So many of the topics that were mentioned here are on that website. The dispensary letters. So um, all of you who came in, um, you probably saw the resource table. I really think it's important for you to check out all of the resources, but most specifically, a letter from Botero, which is the only dispensary right now that's open in Franklin. And we, again, I mentioned this before, have a really strong relationship with Botera, and they are 100% not supportive of individuals under 21 using marijuana substances. That is highlighted in their letter, and I really encourage you to look at that letter, read it over. Um, they talk a bit about what substances do to the adolescent brain and body, what their expectations are for their customers, what they will do to any of the customers who they find out are supplying folks who are underage, and also what the state statutes are. To the other side of the page is the SAFE logo, uh, the SAFE conversation cues. If you click on that link, um, that will provide almost like a postcard of how to have a conversation with your child and then a sample conversation on the back. Um, our contact info is www.safecoalitionma.org. All of you will see the Safe Coalition trifold on the resource table, either there or near the Hidden and Plate site room. And we do not have a DA letter from um, the DA's office on the social post law, but I do think it's really important to highlight. We can send that out in a link. So the social post law really explains um, what will happen to an individual over 21 who supplies an individual under 21 with alcohol. Um, and we have seen that more recently where parents um, do supply in a child with alcohol maybe for their 17th or 18th birthday. And uh, just most recently, not too long ago, a family was charged um, with child endangerment as a felony. And one of the, the parents was actually a teacher and lost her job. So I think that it's really, really important for us to become educated on the social post law, what resources there are in the community. And please, please, please come and take a look at the Hidden and Plain site room. We have um, a whole display set up, but we also have something really interesting and timely. So we have products from Votera, the dispensary, to show you what our kids are using related to edibles. Um, and I challenge you, uh, when you look at those, to even find where it says THC product on there. So please feel free to join any of us in, our, in the classrooms, take a tour of the Hidden and Plain Site bedroom, um, and we'd love to have conversations with any and all of you. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Okay, so um, this is Ron, can we forward that slide? Okay, so this is the audience Q&A section. Uh, we know we have folks at home as well tuning in and on Franklin TV, but we're gonna start with the, the people who are in the audience right now. Um, we'll grab a mask. So, yeah. 
And this segment is really meant to be general questions from the audience um, with the intention that there will be breakouts for more specific questions if you want to touch base and have a specific question maybe um, in a discrete location in the classroom for each of our uh, each of our folks. So at this point, does anyone have any questions in general that they'd like to ask our panelists? I was just wondering what type of education is provided in the schools about substance abuse and that's a great question. I can, I can start there, Josh. So we have a health curriculum that does hit on substance abuse and use. Uh, in, in all honesty, we want to provide more opportunities for that. We also have DARE, uh, the program that where our school resource officers come in. It's actually um, now really based on destructive decision making. Um, if you remember DARE growing up, um, it had more of a focus on introdu introduction to drugs and what they were and what they did. And what they learned is over time, there's some longitudinal studies around that, which um, it oftentimes turned into an education on drugs. And I think it, um, that due to the credit of our, our the, the program and our school resource officers, we've really moved to try to align with the mental health component and making sound decisions and giving students and children language for how to navigate some really tricky and risky situations before they're in them. So um, that's been a partnership and we built, I call it a crosswalk, that uh, continues to be really vetted and looked at with the time that we have with our school resource officers and our health teachers to try to build that bridge and, and start doing that. It's a good question. Can I add really quickly? Yes. Additional piece? So as part of our school improvement goal, uh, we're rewriting all of the curriculum here at the high school with a lens on social and emotional learning. So with this idea that you know confidence, uh, support is critical for our young people's growth and for their ability to take on challenges, we know we need to identify it and put it right in to the lessons and units that are being uh, studied here every single day. It's not gonna necessarily sit in an advisory program, it's gonna be experienced by all of our students through all of their teachers and advisors and coaches because we feel like that's the best way to attack this. So it might take the uh, length of the curriculum and adjust it a little, but we're gonna be infusing uh, moments where our students will feel their personal growth within conversations in the class and within experiences tied similarly to our fortunate graduate skills that have been worked on over the last few years. So I think it's the next level of education. It isn't just the X's and O's, so to speak, or the algebraic equations. It's how are we getting our students to have the confidence to take on the challenges in front of them, both around substance abuse and the world we live in. And we're only gonna do that if we focus on their inner strength. And so um, beyond the direct curriculum that addresses substance use, we know we need to build strong individuals, and we're going to do it through uh, adjustments within our lessons and units. Are there any other questions? Okay. Mrs. Monaro, is there any way to tell if there's any questions on, in the chat? checking that for us. So if we move to the next slide. Okay, so um, we're, gonna, we're gonna transition to the breakout section of the, of the evening at this point. So as we said, we have amazing students right here. Bridget, Gretchen, Vedica, here they are. They are just committed. These are students who you know, have plenty to do, have social lives, have multiple things that they're involved with, but find the time to join us, you know, a bunch of uh, older people uh, to meet around and, and address this issue. And I can tell you, just from my experience, to, to be your age and be this invested in your fellow, your fellow students just says a lot about the three of you and the work that's happening, and uh, we certainly appreciate you. And can we just give them a round of applause for you?
because we're going to be breaking off, if we could also give a round of applause for our panelists who are happy. And uh, at this point, what we'll do, hidden in plain sight, uh, as we conclude, if you'd like to see um, the items that Jen was talking about, you can come over, the students will facilitate that. We also have, in the auditorium, if you want to hang out and ask a few more questions, we have two of our phenomenal, outstanding high school counselors and our director of student services who will be hanging in this auditorium. Jen and um, Ann will be here with, with Paula. And finally, the panelists are all going to break off into some individual classrooms led by Mr. Hanna. They're listed there, but I think if we all kind of exit it, you just keep track of who you may want to speak to, that might be the easiest thing to do as we, as we conclude. Um, this is the in-person portion of the evening. We want to thank everybody who tuned in online on Franklin TV. Uh, if you were online through Zoom and got the correct link, we appreciate you being here as well. And we just want to thank you all for, for coming and supporting this work. Have a good evening. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.